Good evening, friends. Uh, and thanks for uh, joining uh, this webinar. Thanks for attending. Thanks for showing interest uh, in Palestinian Christians and in what we have uh, to say about our reality and our uh, circumstances today, our message uh, and our prospects. Um, um, thank you for the Bethel project for inviting me again, uh, which means I wasn't that bad in the first time. Um, in the first time I spoke more on Christian Zionism as a theologian, Diana, that's the word. Uh, today I will be speaking more, I'll put on my uh, clergy uh, uh, hat, uh, if you wish, and I will be speaking as a pastor, um, trying to uh, reflect or to communicate, uh, to project to you the uh, situation of Palestinian Christians, uh, our reality today. Uh, in this time when everybody's focus and attention is to Bethlehem during Christmas, during this Advent season and Christmas, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for this invitation because we want to remind people that Bethlehem is not just a town in history, it's not just a name in the Bible, but it's really a real town today uh, in Palestine, uh, uh, you know, uh, with Palestinians uh, who live in it and have been living in it for uh, quite a while now, hundreds of years, if not more. Uh, Bethlehem is the place where it all started. There has always been a Christian presence in this town. So today uh, I am part of the Palestinian Christian community. Uh, um, and it should not be a surprise that today there are Palestinian Christians. It continues to shock me that people are surprised to know that we exist. Uh, maybe, okay, you're not aware of the political reality, but this is where it all started. It only makes sense that there are Christians here. And indeed, we are honored to be, uh, we are really honored uh, uh, to be uh, 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 those who continue uh, the trajectory or, or the witness of, of the first Christian witness in the land where it all uh, started. If I zoom in into Bethlehem as a town today, uh, today Bethlehem has around, you know, uh, a city of maybe 30, 32,000, 30 Palestinians, uh, 30,000, I mean, Palestinians. Uh, among them, I would say around 8,000 to 9,000 Palestinian Christians belonging to different church traditions and denominations. The two biggest churches are the Catholics and Orthodox, but we also have Lutherans and Malachites and Syrian Orthodox and um, a few other churches. Uh, as Christians, we uh, cooperate, we live well together. We have many initiatives as churches together, uh, very strong ecumenical relationships. Uh, but we also have also a very good relationship with our uh, Muslim neighbors, uh, with whom we've shared this city for uh, a long time. Uh, Sadly, today, the numbers of Christians are dwindling, and I will be sharing as to why uh, in a minute. But uh, Bethlehem remains a very clear uh, in, in its identity as, a, as a, not just a Palestinian town, but distinctly Christian town because of the Church of the uh, Nativity. Uh, but Bethlehem is in the West Bank, and it's uh, in the occupied uh, territory, and when you get into Bethlehem, it's so hard to miss the occupation because the occupation, the Israeli occupation of our land literally controls every aspect of our life. Just to begin with, a small town of Bethlehem, the small district of Bethlehem, I would say, um, is surrounded today by 22 illegal Israeli settlements and the wall that separates it from, from Jerusalem. So the settlements and the wall pretty much isolate uh, uh, the town of Bethlehem. Um, today, if you look at the map of the West Bank, you will realize that uh, our experience as Palestinians, our cities, you know, our, our experience is confined within the cities. Israel controls everything outside of the cities. Uh, I call our experience as gated communities because literally all it takes for Israel is to close these checkpoints that uh, you know, to enter and exit our cities and then we're besieged. And that's not hypothetical, it happens a lot. 
And I'm not even talking about the fact that we in Bethlehem are not able to go to Jerusalem, which is just a few kilometers away. Uh, as a child, I remember taking a bus from outside of our home and 15 minutes later, we're in Jerusalem. Uh, today, if I am among the privileged to have an Israeli permit by the military to go to Jerusalem, very few people have that permit. And if it only takes me 15 minutes to cross the checkpoint, then uh, it's a blessing. Unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of Palestinians cannot go to Jerusalem. Uh, and you have right now a whole generation of Palestinians who live in Bethlehem who have not seen Jerusalem, uh, which is part of our tragedy. Going back to the idea that we are besieged, uh, today we estimate that we Palestinians control only eight, uh, you know, only 13% of the land of Bethlehem because the wall and the settlements have confiscated uh, the rest of the land. We cannot build on all of the land. Our existence is confined to these, uh, uh, to the surrounds of Palestinian uh, cities. So really when I talk about the, the reality of living under occupation, it is a, a, an occupation that controls everything, beginning from the geography, the entrances and access to our towns. Uh, but it goes way beyond that. You know, Israel controls the air. Uh, the, uh, the phone waves, the underground, we cannot dig for water, exports and imports economy. Uh, uh, right now, they are making it difficult for visitors who wish to stay longer than a few days in Bethlehem or a few hours, uh, you know, uh, and, and live in, in Bethlehem to work or to volunteer. Uh, or even spouses of Palestinians uh, are finding it very, very difficult in a very cruel system. Spouses of many Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians, are not able to obtain visa to live in Bethlehem with their spouses, and as a result, choose to live uh, outside. Uh, it's another way of forced immigration of, of Palestinian uh, families. So all of these challenges make the quality of life really, really difficult for Palestinians. Uh, it's ironic that since uh, the peace process started, all we've seen is the expansion of Israeli settlements on the expense of Palestinian uh, life. Uh, and as a result, we've seen more and more Palestinians leaving. Uh, unemployment is so high. Interestingly, especially in Bethlehem, uh, the economy of Bethlehem depends almost entirely, maybe to a fault, on tourism. And as such, we've had a, a devastating uh, uh, two years from the year 2000 until just recently because of COVID. Uh, we're grateful that tourist pilgrims are beginning to come back to Bethlehem. We pray they choose to stay longer in Bethlehem and not just visit for a day or at best for two to three hours to visit the Nativity uh, Church. Uh, but because of this too much dependence on Bethlehem, uh, on, on tourism, uh, there isn't much opportunities beyond tourism to uh, many Palestinians in, in Bethlehem. Uh, when people ask me, why are Palestinian Christians leaving? Uh, I remind them that most statistics and studies show that Palestinian Christians and Muslims almost leave at the same rate, which tells you something about the overall reality of difficulty, restrictions, unemployment, uh, life under occupation and, and the limitations uh, all while we're seeing our occupiers expand, uh, and uh, today it should not come as a surprise for those who follow, that more and more human rights organizations, legal organizations, including Israeli ones, are using the word apartheid to describe these Israeli policies of control and, and segregation. So when you think, or when I'm asked about the biggest challenge Palestinian Christians face, I say we face these challenges because we're Palestinians and their occupation in Bethlehem. This is by far our biggest uh, challenge. Uh, and everything else falls within this big matrix of, uh, of uh, occupation. Uh, and today, uh, you know, one of the missions of the church uh, is to stop this wave uh, of, of immigration. I always say I don't think that you will find any other context other than the Palestinian context in which uh, the main or the main uh, 
the, the priority of the church, the mission of the church, it's to keep its people in that land. But this is today our biggest fear that uh, uh, the more people leave because of the reality, uh, the more we will continue to uh, experience this uh, immigration. And our biggest nightmare is for uh, uh, Palestine to become empty of, of, of Christians. Uh, this situation that I described of, of apartheid uh, is what many are calling the death of the two-state solution. Uh, and uh, maybe the death of the two-state solution, our fear is the death of any peaceful solution. Uh, and to be honest, this is a nightmare that many of us are, are having and wishing against that, working against that there will be uh, a resolution. But within our cities, you know, uh, with this reality of despair as as a pastor i have so many uh uh discussions with young people who are considering immigration and uh giving them hope or encouraging them to stay is is very difficult to be honest i wish uh you know humanly speaking it's hard to convey you know because uh i understand it doesn't make sense to stay here uh, uh from many ways but at the same time we are needed because despite of the very difficult situation uh, please understand that uh, not only there is a strong not in numbers strong palestinian christian presence today yeah, it's 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 uh, it resembles the wider picture of palestinians uh, uh, we speak about the palestinian sumud resilience uh, steadfastness uh, and I think the church embodies that spirit of Sumud. We've survived thousands of years of empires, one empire after the other. Uh, how do we continue to survive as Palestinians and as Palestinian Christians? Just look at our history from biblical times until today. This land has always been under occupation. This land has always been controlled by empires. The biblical times are clear, you know, Babylonians, Assyrians, Persians, Greek, the Romans, and the Byzantines, the Arabs, uh, uh, the uh, Turkish Empire before that, the, the Crusaders, uh, the British Mandate, obviously this group is well aware of this, uh, and we still see Israel as a continuation of that settler colonial uh, uh, process. Uh, this has created a sense of resilience among many Palestinians, so yes, some are leaving or many are leaving, but those who stay are very resilient. The church embodies that spirit. Uh, today in the Palestinian territories, uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories, I'm talking about the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. Uh, maybe my focus is on Bethlehem, but um, you know, speak in general. Uh, there is a very strong Palestinian Christian presence, not in numbers necessarily. In numbers in the Palestinian territories, we are around 1%. Uh, but in terms of presence, it is a very active presence. Uh, we have many schools, uh, many hospitals. In fact, one third of the health sector in the West Bank is either supported by the church or run by the church. It's a big number for a 1%. Uh, as I said, we have so many schools. We have universities, um, cultural centers, poets, uh, even many politicians, many in the Palestinian authorities. Uh, and I must admit, you know, uh, despite uh, many things we can say about the Palestinian Authority in terms of performance and some challenges, uh, uh, some deficiencies, and maybe uh, the performance when it comes to negotiations and so on, and, uh, uh, you know, we can criticize the Palestinian Authority for many things. But when it comes to absorbing or to, uh, 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 you know, to uh, uh, giving rights to all citizenship i think that's something to be commended for so uh, for us as christians in this land uh under the palestinian authority 10 palestinian towns and villages have palestinian mayors by law the law says that we must have palestinian mayors in these towns and villages this includes as i said bethlehem where the mayor is christian even though we are less than what 30 percent in ramallah the major palestinian town today where christians make less than five percent uh, the mayor also is is Christian. Uh, we had many government officials, um, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Tourism and others, the Minister of Finance are Christians of communication. So in a cabinet of around 22 ministers, four are Christians. 
so in terms of our presence, our contribution, uh, it's not proportional to our numbers. And we are anything but uh, a, a resilient victimized mi minority that just adopts the sense of victimization. Uh, we have a strong sense of pride uh, as being part of the Palestinian people, continuing that process and so mood resilience, but also, as I said, uh, continuing the Christian presence where it all uh, where it all uh, started. So this is why, by the way, we continue and encourage people who visit, don't just visit the sites. I mean, it's good to visit them. We want you to visit the Nativity Church and so on. But remember that the Holy Land, as you know, it's known in pilgrimage, is much more than sites. It's people. It's a very active churches, very impactful churches. Uh, with very strong uh, message to the uh, community. Uh, maybe uh, to give uh, a sense of some of the things we're doing, uh, a small church like ours, like the Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, that's the name of our church. Uh, just yesterday and today, yesterday we had a big conference, a uh, national conference uh, organized by our church on creation care uh, and environmental care. Uh, so as a church, we're playing a leading role in, in that uh, field. Today, we had a big conference, another national conference in Ramallah on gender justice uh, in the court and in the society and also uh, in the church, but it's more than just uh, in the church. So uh, our presence is just not just, you know, we pray and, and do our Christian stuff, but we're trying to be, as, as we, you know, we love to say, the salt and light uh, into our community. We have many interfaith uh, initiatives with our Muslim uh, neighbors, uh, because honestly, you know, we're beginning to sense how the Muslim community uh, within it, we're beginning to see some um, uh, trends of Islamicism, if you wish, or uh, religious fundamentalism <clears throat> that is creating a gap between Christians and Muslims. Uh, it's a phenomenon that's been taking place in the Arab world for the last 20 years or so. And that's creating some sense of a gap between Christians and Muslims. It's not tension. I would describe it more as, as, as a gap. And as such, uh, we're meeting with many, many concerned Muslim leaders and scholars who, who see this and we're trying together to bridge uh, that gap uh, that gap as well. So this is, I'm, 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 I'm trying to give you a window into the life of Palestinian Christians. The bigger picture under occupation, more than that, uh, but even within that very active uh, community. Uh, but maybe to continue and to close the circle on our challenges, I mentioned the political, the economical, uh, but it's really important also to address one of the biggest challenges we have is uh, what I call Western Christian attitudes to the land. I spoke briefly in this uh, group, to this group on Christian Zionism. But it's much more than traditional Christian Zionism. Western Christian attitudes to this land uh, span from, you know, you go back to the Belfort days, the idea of a land without people. Uh, looking at Palestinians in a colonial sense and not seeing Palestinians, not seeing us as equals, seeing the land as empty, even though they knew the land had people. This approach continues today in many church circles where uh, not just that there are support to Israel, I think, think of the language in the church, the language of Jews returning to their land. It's a very common language, even among friends. Uh, and I say that language puts me as a Palestinian in this, as if now I am occupying someone else's land. When you say they return to their land as if I didn't get the memo that this is their land and it's now my fault, I become the occupier, even though we've been living here for hundreds, if not thousands of years as people. Uh, so the language of the church, the theology of the church, which focuses more or exclusively sometimes on the church and the Jewish people, the land, the covenant with Abraham and so on, as if, you know, it's an empty land, as if there are no Palestinians living and Christian Zionism is the most extreme expression. But at the same time today, uh, one of our biggest attitudes is the fact that there are many uh, what I call diplomatic churches. Uh, neutral churches, churches who pray for both sides and pray for peace and 
think that they are contributing for peace, uh, but by not challenging Israel on its human rights abuses, breaking the international law, uh, and looking at the conflict as if it's a conflict between equals, they are enabling the occupier. They are just empowering uh, the, uh, the occupier. So today we are struggling, to be honest, not just from Christian Zionists, but from churches who are silent, churches who take neutral positions or churches who just pray for peace and don't want to be political. Because in all of that, I believe they are enabling um, the oppressor. And I'll come back to that uh, in the end. Uh, so on top of all of that, it's it's very disheartening, to be honest, when we are struggling to survive, literally struggling to survive, doing all that we can, trusting God's grace, uh, struggling to maintain our institutions, our schools, uh, Yet seeing billions of dollars, I'm not, I'm not exact, billions, not millions, coming from churches to Israel and to settlement projects. Uh, it's so disheartening, and that's a soft word, when, uh, you know, during the Trump presidency, we saw this massive Christian support uh, to Israel uh, among evangelicals. It's very disheartening when uh, we cry out, for example, as in the latest example of the World Council of Churches, many of us Palestinian Christian activists were there and saying, what about the reports that call Israel apartheid? And the response we get, well, apartheid is not a helpful language. It will alienate our friends. Let's use a more soft language and say we're more concerned about the reality on the ground, you know, while, you know, you want us to be more concerned about your feelings or your friends. We're more concerned about describing the reality on the ground mm. as it is. So it's very disheartening to see the church not taking a strong stand for justice or on the other extreme churches who are very much pro, uh, pro-Israel. Uh, there is so much work to do when it comes to how churches should be involved uh, in, in our land. So in this very difficult reality and this reality of despair where honestly we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, what is the Christian uh, uh, message? And what does Christmas mean to us here uh, in Bethlehem? So if you bear with me for the next five or seven minutes, I'm going to, again, adopt my uh, clergy hat and speak as a pastor. What's Christmas to us here uh, in Bethlehem? What will I be preaching about in this season or in many other seasons? You know, this is a favorite time for us. Uh, the attention of the world where many celebrations, many big celebrations, uh, uh, national, on the municipality level, on the government level, on the church level, ecumenical, many, many celebrations. Uh, and, you know, uh, Bethlehem becomes anything but this small, little and silent town. Uh, I've been thinking recently about the song Silent Night. Because in reality, uh, Christmas night in Bethlehem today, just as it was 2,000 years ago, is anything but silent. Uh, the song should be hectic night, noisy night, uh, difficult night. Uh, uh, let's remember that when Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, he was born in similar circumstances. Let's consider the terminology, the vocabulary surrounding the birth narrative. An empire? A census, let's not forget what a census is. Uh, a census is a way of taxation and control. Uh, and just think of this young family, a pregnant young woman having to travel in difficult circumstances just because this emperor in Rome wants to get more tax and he wants to do a census. So when you talk about a ruthless empire, which then we see its manifestation when there was a massacre against children. Um, and it's in this environment that Jesus was born. Anything but silent, my friends. Uh, but then let's consider the other terminology. He was born in a cave among the occupied, mind you. This is a very important part of the narrative. Uh, among a family that later became a refugee because of political tyranny. They had to escape Bethlehem to Egypt. And the first people who brought the big and good news that a savior was born were shepherds. Uh, not 
you know, high class in the community, very simple. And I come from the shepherd's field, the shepherd's son. We still make this self joke about ourselves. Um, and this is important element of the narrative again, because 2000 years ago, the good news was usually that Caesar is born or in the son for Caesar is born. It's given by military and so on, or a victory is happening. The good news that came uh, the day Jesus was born, that you know, this guy, you know, someone was born not in Rome in, a, in, a, in the palace, or not that there was a political or a military victory. No, no, the good news was that Jesus was born in a, in a manger, in a cave, uh, among a, a, a family that's really nobody. Uh, in that sense, when you think of the word Emmanuel, I think it's here clear to me that God takes sides in this story. Uh, he, uh, God, uh, uh, is in solidarity with a family that became a refugee family. God is in solidarity with the oppressed, with the marginalized, with those who are living under the impact and the, 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 the influence of, of a difficult tyrant, uh, empire. And God brings good news through the lowly, through the, those who, you know, we didn't give so much steps. This is good news. This is the good news for us as uh, Palestinians uh, in that God is in solidarity with us in the midst of our difficult, uh, in the midst of our difficult uh, reality. Uh, yeah. And in the midst of this difficult reality, 2000 years ago, the angels came with this message, peace on earth. Um, what is this speed? And I think we've, softened we've cheapened this piece i think many times when we talk about it as just this individualistic feeling uh, this was a challenge to the uh, pax romana concept of caesar caesar bringing peace through might through power through control through a new strong economical system uh, this is a radical challenge by uh, the gospels to that mentality ideology of of empires to me again that's so comforting uh, uh, and in that this is a challenge to the logic of empires this is a challenge to the message of the occupation and apartheid uh today uh to me when i hear these words peace on earth i hear it more as a mandate uh, we have a mandate to make peace we are called to be peacemakers after all as christians jesus said that blessed are uh, the peacemakers but what does that mean does it mean neutrality and playing for both sides uh, again from the christmas narrative i don't think so uh, and today i say uh, if, if you see two people arguing then okay yeah you pray for both sides and you tell them get along but if you see two people not just fighting but one stepping at the throat of the other literally suffocating him and beating him you don't call for peace. You call for the end of the oppression and the end of violence. Uh, and this is what is needed today. This is our call as, a, as, as Christians, as Palestinians today. Uh, if you really want to help us live in peace uh, and continue the message here, uh, please help us get rid of this ugly occupation, this ugly reality we live in. Uh, and this is not a time for neutrality uh, and diplomacy. Uh, we're losing hope literally from the human sense from the uh we're losing hope from governments we're losing hope from the international community how many vetoes do we need how many resolutions we need uh, but and i'll conclude here before we get some questions despite everything i want to tell you that we are hopeful people uh and it's not cheap hope that just you know it's a good thing no we're hopeful people because we're here, we're resilient, we're working. Uh, hope today is, is, is our ministry, is our mission. Hope is not waiting for something. Uh, I think I've said this like 10 times in the last three weeks in my sermons. We don't, you know, hope, we're not waiting for something. We create something through our action. Uh, my predecessor at Christmas Lutheran Church, Reverend Mitri Rahib, uh, used to say, continues to say, hope is what we, Hope is what we do today. Uh, and, and the Christian hope is rooted in our action. And so they, uh, as we are 
uh, holding fast to that hope, continuing the Christian message where it all started in Bethlehem and beyond. We call you to join us in our ministry of hope and in our ministry uh, of peace. So thank for uh, uh, your patience for listening. And I hope that uh, I was able in the 30 minutes or so to give you a window of life in Bethlehem, our challenges as churches, uh, but also what Christmas means to us and what hope is uh, to us. Thank you again. And back to you, Diana, uh, for uh, questions. Hello. That was, <clears throat> that was just fascinating and depressing, which is the theme of all of our talks, it seems. Um, we've had a lot of comments and questions, um, lots of comments about how amazing your talk was. Please do pop any comments you have for Munther in the chat box because I will share it with him afterwards. Um, and I agree, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I do have one comment I wanted to share from Catherine Locke. What an incredible talk. I was in Bethlehem and other places a few weeks ago with the Quaker group. Very difficult rehearsing carols to sing with my choir in our Christmas concert. This webinar is helping, bless you. Um, I made a note that it was really interesting what you had said about 13% of Bethlehem being in under Palestinian control. I, did, I knew it was a small figure, but I didn't realize it was that tiny. Um, and we've got a comment from David Haslam. 13% of the land with the Palestinian own is exactly the same as the 13% of South Africa's land that Africans owned under the apartheid system, another parallel, parallel with Israeli apartheid, which I just thought was a really interesting point. Um, so I'm going to start with the, uh, the first question, which is one that came in in advance, which I had shared with you already, Munther. One of the first things that Arafat government of the PA did was to incorporate the neighboring refugee camp into the municipality of Bethlehem. What have the effects been in terms of services, town budgets, changes in elections, etc.? That's from Frank Adam. Yeah, um, I, you know, in fact, I think um, the refugee uh, uh, crisis is is very important to to the Palestinian uh, case because uh, refugees have the right to return. If, you know, nobody can deny them that right until unless they choose to, and they have it. So, uh, the fact that we continue to call for their uh, rights is so. I, I hope that's not missed in this discussion. Uh, second, you know, the UN is still active among these refugee camps. They're still providing yeah. services. Uh, and so they were not really fully absorbed into the uh, 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 into the municipalities. Uh, but at the same time, they are not as if a separate uh, entity within. The, they have some autonomy within themselves, but at the same time, you know, refugee camp people work with us, live with us and, and deal with us. How does that affect changes in terms of uh, uh, municipality and so on? Not much, to be honest. I mean, uh, uh, the people in the refugee camp represent the people of the Palestinians. They still have the same political fractions, the same divisions, if you wish. Uh, and if, uh, if the question is also about uh, if they affect the result of whether there will be a Christian mayor or not. No, the law says it's a Christian mayor regardless. I mean, we've had a Christian mayor backed by Hamas at a certain point. Uh, so uh, 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 that doesn't really change much in terms of uh, the internal life of, of, of Bethlehem. Uh, other than, of course, you know, it's it, 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 it affects the continuity of the municipality and so on. Uh, but to us, uh, the refugee situation uh, is 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 important that we don't that nothing is done that jeopardizes the rights of uh, of return. There are plenty of refugee camps in the West Bank, by the way, not just uh, in Bethlehem, and it's the same situation. Thank you. Um, yes, and you know I'm Palestinian Christian myself, and I'm always shocked by how few people realize that we exist. And I often get asked when I converted and I ask them in return, when did you convert? Because it is one of our exports. Um, we have had a question from uh, Rod 
McCrory, apologies if I say people's names wrong. Um, we've already established I'm not good at saying words. Um, are Palestinian Christians treated any different, different from Palestinian Muslims by the Israeli authorities? You touched on it, but if you could expand on that, that'd be amazing. By, by the Israeli authorities, no. Um, I still can't go to Jerusalem. I, you know, I'm, I'm the Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem. Today, I cannot go to Jerusalem. No. Um, uh, we get maybe this exception that we can apply Christmas season, not in the last three, four years. Uh, you were not even, you know, not many Palestinian Christians are getting permits to go pray in, in Jerusalem. Right now, as a clergy, I don't have one. Um, when Israel confiscates land, it, it doesn't care if it's, if it's owned by Palestinian Christians or Palestinian Muslims. What matters is the expansion of Israeli settlements. Um, the nation state law is clear. This is a Jewish land. The right for self-determination is exclusive to the Jewish people and so on. So uh, anything that's not Palestinian, and, you know, so, so the, the, the ideology of Jewish supremacy uh, does not differentiate if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, as long as you're Palestinian. Uh, so the, the short answer and clear answer is no, we lose land. Uh, 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 Shirin Abu Agli, who was martyred, is a Christian. So Israeli bullets do not discriminate. Uh, the occupation does not discriminate. Uh, it's occupation against Palestinians. It does not differentiate, I would say, not discriminate between Palestinian, between Christians and Muslims. Thank you for that answer. Um, we've got a question from Shumana Husseini. Uh, do you feel or think that the Israel Israeli brutal arrest of Shadi Khoury was intended as an intimidating message to his active parents because he and they are Christians? Do you think the Israeli occupation specifically does not want to see Christians active in resisting the occupation in any way? So a kind of follow on from what you were saying specifically with regards to Shadi Khoury? And no, I, I think uh, they are targeting anybody who's, who's active and you know, who's active in armed resistance or nonviolent resistance. Israel is completely paranoid right now. It's, it's, it's shocking the amount of, uh, and as long as they continue to have this immunity to arrest children, they will continue to do it. Uh, uh, Shadi was arrested and released, thankfully. Uh, but um, yesterday, uh, another, uh, or three days ago, uh, in the Hesha camp, another 16-year-old Palestinian kid was shot in front of his house. His brother was arrested uh, and he was martyred. He was killed. Um, so, uh, you know, Israel is in this campaign to arrest activists, to arrest, uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, if it's violent, they kill and assassinate people. Uh, it's, it's very depressing uh, to see Israel's treatment of not just Palestinians, but in particular, Palestinian uh, children. Now, was it intentional as a as a message to his uh, his parents? Uh, I don't know. Uh, what I know is, while he was in, in prison, uh, his father led a Palestinian orchestra, mainly of young Palestinians. Uh, they did an amazing uh, concert. Uh, he spoke of all prisoners, not just of his son. It was so moving to see his son in jail. Uh, yet him leading this uh, Palestinian arc. It was uh, very moving. They're an amazing family. Um, fantastic. Uh, we had a couple of questions about um, the issue that you raised about spouses um, not being able to get permits to live in Bethlehem. Um, could you clarify how that works when you have a Palestinian couple that are married and because um, it happens fairly often where one cannot yeah. get permit to live with the other and, and where do they yeah. end up going? Yeah, thank you. So Israel controls the family registration system. Um, as such, they control where I can live, who I can register as members of my family, children, and so on. Israel controls every aspect of our lives. So um, for a Palestinian from the West Bank to marry a Palestinian from Gaza, it's, it's impossible, it's very difficult, or from East Jerusalem and then the West Bank. This is how Israel maintains control of Palestinians by fragmenting us and uh, every one of us have a different ID. We're all Palestinians, but Israel controls us through this ID system. 
uh, and at the same time, Israel also controls. So uh, in this case, by the way, we have Palestinians many Palestinians were not able to unite and end up living outside, whether they're East Jerusalemites or, or from Gaza or from the diaspora community. Uh, at the same time, you know, Israel controls the visa. That's, you know, who enters. and who. So if someone from the UK wants to visit us to Bethlehem, uh, that person needs a visa from the Israeli authorities, uh, whether they get it at the airport or, or in advance. Uh, but try at the airport to say, oh, we're going to stay in Bethlehem for two to three weeks. Th they might send you out. Actually, right now they're making it. There is a law that you need to declare if you have, if you're falling in love with a Palestinian and you're a Western and you need to declare that. It's This is how ridiculous Israeli systems are. So that person, uh, whether uh, American, European, is not able to stay because Israel would not grant that person a visa. If they know you're married a Palestinian, that's an extra intensive not to give you a visa. Uh, so you have to try to hide that and keep coming as a tourist to the country uh, and leave every three months because Israeli visas are for three months. Now you can apply for a family reunification as they call it, Lam Shemin. Uh, there are literally thousands of cases of Palestinians who applied and every 10 to 15 years, Israel grants a few thousands. Uh, many of them Gaza to West Bank, very few from outside. Uh, I have a, one of my best friends, uh, a church member, a colleague at the Bethlehem Bible College is married to a woman from Bolivia. She hasn't been able even to visit them. Uh, his, his, they, they moved to England. Now they're doing studies, hoping that the, there's a miracle and the law has changed. Uh, it, it, it happens to many. And uh, what they end up doing, either uh, that spouse comes to Israel, you know, enters the land uh, as a tourist and stays illegally. Uh, so there are prisoners in a Palestinian town, say in Bethlehem or Ramallah, hoping that, you know, their name is among the list every 10 to 15 years. Uh, or they give up and uh, leave and live in the in the country of the spouse. Uh, so that's that's what happens today. It's Again, it's a very cruel system. Keeping in mind that any Jewish person can claim this land home and immigrate to it and live in it and get more rights than ours. Um, so the short answer, the short answer to your question is actually one word, apartheid. Yeah, it's heartbreaking to see families torn apart. Um, we have had comments from Jeffrey Marshall and Johnny Byrne, who both mentioned the Al Rawad Society from Ida camp in Bethlehem. Uh, Jeffrey in particular says last night he very much enjoyed the dance and the drama by it, um, by the Al Rawad Society, and not to miss the rest of the British tour if you can. So do keep an eye out for that. Um, I've got a question from Dorothy Pearson. Do you think, Reverend Munther, that there is enough land to make a state of Palestine, or do you think the future is equal rights for all people of the land and the occupation and create an equal society for all? Um, what I care for is, is equal rights. What I call for is, is, is equal rights, equal responsibilities, a system in which there are no second class citizens. Um, now, is the two-state solution um, that path, or is it a one-state shared government or two governments, a confederate? Uh, you know, we could ponder that. Uh, what I care about mainly, as I said, the language we're using right now is the language of shared rights, while at the same time realizing that what we have on the ground today is, is a one-state, an apartheid state. Uh, and so, Bringing it back to my illustration, uh, right now what we have is a system of oppression, and, and I don't think we can even begin talking about peace and solutions before ending that oppression, before holding the oppressors accountable. We're not even able to hold Israel accountable for the crimes it's committing. So uh, uh, the question of one state or two state right now becomes, you know, there's so much distance between uh, this and the reality on the ground. Uh, and, and whenever I get that question, I say, can we focus on the reality and first put our priority together to hold Israel accountable and 
to stop uh, uh, the oppression. Because while we're talking about one state or two state, as I said, we're not even able to convince churches to use international definitions to call you know the situation on the ground what is is happening. So uh, you know, let's focus on uh, ending the occupation or the system as it is right now, the status quo. Thank you. Um, we have, I have a question and I don't know whether you'll have the answer to this on hand or whether it's something that we might have to email people later on, but it's a, it's an idea that I love. This is from Mike uh, Miniter. Again, apologies if I'm saying your name wrong. There was a comment about um, on our carols and their inadequacy. He says, indeed, could we have Palestinian carols and Palestinian prayers and songs that we could introduce in our worship, ones that connect us to the current experience? Is it possible for Munther to give sources or contacts for this? Um, we don't have many. We have some, very few, but not many. Uh, but maybe I can later send some links to some. Yeah, but nothing comes uh, comes uh, directly uh, to mind. Well, I will chase you up on that and we'll send it round to our followers because I do love the idea of, of that. Um, you, there was a question about um, that you kind of answered in your talk when you when you talked about um, when you see a fight you might pray for both sides and for peace, but if you see one person specifically targeting another in a very oppressive way, that you might be praying for uh, justice and for that oppression to end. So someone asked about that specifically, and as a, 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 but I feel like you answered it when you talked about that, but as a follow on to that, we've got from Lizzie Tippetts. Um, she says, it's so difficult to hear about the painful reality for Palestinians. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. How do you persevere in this without giving in to bitterness and hate in the face of all that you're suffering? Um, this is just a very difficult situation. This is a very difficult question because um, uh, it's very hard to fight against hatred. Uh, and against bitterness, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I wish I could tell you we're excellent at it or we're good at it or uh, we're all humans. We get angry, we get frustrated. I think uh, we always pray that, you know, we cannot act out of revenge. Uh, and love the enemies doesn't mean accepting them or accepting, uh, I mean, their, their aggression or their acts. Uh, the Kairos Palestine document speaks about uh, you know that when 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 you love the enemy or when you love your friend, even you try to correct them uh, and you try to stop them from doing you know evil doings. So um, in a sense, you know, you always have to look deep and ask yourself, "Am I doing this out of revenge?" I think the ultimate goal remains to us. You know, I will say, ending the occupation is not the goal. Be becoming neighbors and friends with the Israelis is the goal. But that's a very distant goal. The immediate goal is ending the occupation. Uh, but we cannot do it out of hatred and out of uh, feelings of, of, of revenge. Um, for some, it comes across as too radical or too naive when we say, you know, uh, the occupation is uh, ruining God's image, not just in the occupied, in the occupied but also in the occupied. So in a sense, we see part of the mission is to liberate both uh, the occupier and the occupied. We're not comparing as if it's the same. No, there's, you know, of course it's not the same. Uh, but in that sense, loving our enemies means trying to correct them and make them live in line with God's intention and, and will for humanity. Thank you. Um, I... As a result of that last question about carols for Palestine and prayers for Palestine, we had a bunch of suggestions from the audience. So thank you so much for that. I have pasted them back in the chat box so that everyone can see. So um, do check those out if you're interested in some sort of Palestinian themed um, carols and so forth. There were some very interesting ones that were recommended from Sabil. Um, Garth Hewitt is, is, is always excellent. These are English ones. 
Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of sending a couple of Arabic uh, Christmas tunes, but this is good. Yeah. We've got from Fosna, Friends of Sabil, North America, from Garth Hewitt, um, some modern versions of A Little Town of Beth- Bethlehem and so forth. So do do check that out if, if you were interested in that. Um, I'm going to wrap up with the last sort of two questions because I like to end on some hope and also what can we do? Um, our audience is largely based in the UK. So um, I will be taking, these are two questions that are very linked from Michael Eggleton. What could we do practically to help, for example, to raise the issue with our churches and our government? And Peter Rand, he says, I was in Bethlehem last Saturday with Reverend Munther, so hopefully you remember him. How does he believe we in the UK can best encourage and actively help the Christians to remain in their country? So what can we do to help to raise awareness about this within our churches and governments? And how can we help Christians still living in the Holy Land? Uh- yeah, so uh, maybe I'll end with that with that question. Layla and Milad was mentioned. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, um, and uh, oh goodness, um, uh, l- last week we there was um, uh, a joint simulcast service between the cathedral in Glasgow and uh, the church in Bethlehem, highlighting that Palestinian Christians are here. Christmas is not just a narrative. Uh, but also, uh, you know, calling Christians to be aware of the plights of, of Palestinians. I think it was organized by Friends of the Holy Land. And and you mentioned Friends of Sabirs and others. There are many Christian organizations uh, uh, that are, uh, you know, in touch with Palestinian Christians uh, and uh, trying to uh, not just pray, but, but support. Uh, trying not just to, uh, uh, you know, do the typical, even, you know, the, the whole approach of charity, uh, uh, Diane, is, is important because we're not asking for charity, uh, but we're asking for uh, uh, support to our presence uh, uh, in the sense of we need our rights, we need our uh, our freedom. So what can be done? I think it's important what you're doing is to continue to put pressure on governments and churches to hold Israel accountable for what it's doing. Uh, the question is, how does Israel continue uh, to do what it's it's doing? Uh, and I and I simply say because they can get away with it. Nobody is holding Israel accountable, uh, and that's why I spent a lot of time also talking to churches because, you know, churches have a role, in the sense of you know again praying or sending donations, but in the sense of holding their governments and holding uh, uh, their uh, elected officials accountable for uh, representing them and for uh, their continued the, the immunity that uh, Israel continues to uh, enjoy from uh, from the world based on, on what it's doing. Uh, but I would also say, come and see, come and visit us, uh, come and spend time with us, come and uh, 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 visit our ministries, uh, spend time with our families, spend times in, in Bethlehem, don't just do the typical pilgrims route. I hope, you know, COVID is, I hope it's behind us so people can travel now, uh, people can uh, enjoy uh, the community life in Bethlehem. Uh, we have a lot of cultural life. So when you come and visit, please don't just do the typical cultural uh, pilgrims thing, but also spend time with our families, uh, um, we have good food, trust me, uh, good hospitality. Uh, uh, this empowers us, especially as Christians who feel, you know, uh, uh, marginalized. Uh, and and we need people who speak the truth. Uh, uh, you know, for many years, we've had many of our friends who are maybe too neutral to a fault. And now we're asking churches, uh, we cannot afford this diplomatic approach anymore. So we, we ask churches to speak truth uh, to power and, uh, and, and and to be uh, to what I'm beginning to call this concept of prophetic peacemaking. Uh, we need to be prophetic in our approach or to use a very strong Christian language, but prophetic meaning challenging, uh, 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 speaking truth to power and calling for uh, for justice. Thank you so much. And I would like to add also that please do consider sharing this webinar 
with your churches, with your networks and so forth. And if you can get Palestinian Christians to speak to your church groups and to your congregations, that's always a great way to start spreading the word as well. Um, Thank you so much everyone for attending. I have in the chat box um, made a little plea because these webinars are free, um, but we do need support in order to be able to keep them free and to be able to spread the word as far and wide as possible. We've had um, hopefully a, um, uh, hopefully you've all thought the same. We've had a long list of amazing speakers talking on a range of topics to do with this issue. So, um, so that there's a hook or an angle that might appeal to anyone you know, hopefully we've had um, artists, we've had historians, we've had politicians, we've had all kinds of people, we've had members of the clergy. So uh, please do have a look at our past webinars as well and share them. And if you would like to support us, I have posted in the chat box the links to make a donation. If you can spare the, cup of a, the price of a cup of coffee, um, and if you sign up to be a friend of the Balfour Project, meaning you sign up for any amount, um, as a regular donation, either monthly or yearly, uh, we have um, we have friend events, specifically friend events. We had one last week, which was amazing. It was our first friends meeting where we had a select number of friends come along and be able to talk um, to some of the trustees and other Balfour Project home team about the work of the Balfour Project and their concerns and their feedback and so forth. But we also give you free tickets to some of our events, such as the film screenings and so forth. It really helps us with planning our work um, and cuts down on admin. So we would love to have more friends. Who wouldn't? So please do consider that if you can. Um, so I have had some responses from people saying that they haven't managed to click on the links that I shared with the songs and the prayers and so forth. I will send an email out tomorrow with all of those links to all of the people that register to this talk so that um, you can have access to them. Uh, apologies for that. I really don't know why some people can do that on Zoom and others can't. But um, thank you so much for all of your suggestions. We've had a bunch more, so I'll include them all in the, um, in the email that I send out. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the attendees, there have been loads, you've had fantastic questions, sorry I didn't get through all of them, and of course to thank you Munther because it's amazing when you come and talk to us, you make everything so much clearer, you give us such an insight of what it's like on the ground, um, we'll probably invite you back because we've had so many more questions and we love having you here, so please do come back and speak to us. Um, so thank you all. Have a lovely evening. Have a Merry Christmas for those that we don't speak to before. And um, hopefully we'll have a better year next year. So thank you very, very much, everyone.